Hi everyone, good evening. Welcome to another session of Dog Spot Live. And today we have a very special guest all the way from Brooklyn, uh, New York. Uh, we're going to talk uh, to Philly, who has the smartest dog in the world. And her name was Chaser. She could identify over a thousand toys and things. And it's her first death anniversary today. So we thought what better day to celebrate her life and her story than today. Thank you for joining us, Philly. Welcome to Dog Spot. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Musarat. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. And and I greatly appreciate um, having this on the memorial of her transition to her next adventure. Um, so this it's meaningful to me today. Thank you. No, the pleasure is all ours. And we're lucky to hear her story from you. Uh, you know, uh, who better? I mean, since your dad has also passed. So, I mean, and you spent a lot of time with her. And you were her manager, so to say, right? Oh, I was. I was. <laughs> I. Uh, it was uh, no small feat to uh, wrangle an old man and his dog because they were both uh, they were both going off in different directions and uh, uh, had very strong uh, desires to do what they wanted to do. Right. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Chaser and your dad and uh, how did you get her and you know, just, just start from the beginning. Um, Wow, so that's a really um, uh, great question. And it starts, it actually starts with our family animals. My dad was a behaviorist, an animal behaviorist, and a professor uh, of psychology, behavioral psychology, and at Wofford College in South Carolina, featuring, um, focusing on animal cognition. So, uh, he began his career with rats and pigeons, but what he discovered would be more meaningful for his students was mm -hmm. working with our family dogs. And mm -hmm. the family dog that inspired him to work with dogs was our family dog, Yasha, who was a border collie, German shepherd mix. And Yasha could learn things so quickly that my dad was convinced that he would really shine in the classroom, and uh, which he did, he did. Um, but what what happened was in dad's research, his really his main goal was to teach Yasha human language and nouns. But what he discovered in his research in the lab was that dogs could learn behaviors, very complex behaviors, very quickly. But when he tried to isolate the noun, which was the name of an object like rope um, or newspaper, from the action of fetch the newspaper, they weren't able to learn nouns uh, independent of verbs. And a really good fast example of that is when we would ask Yasha to fetch the newspaper outside, he did it really quickly. And he would, before you could get the words out, he was out there grabbing the newspaper. And we've all seen this with our dogs. But the minute the newspaper was in the house and my dad would ask him to fetch the, find the newspaper, it didn't make sense to him. He couldn't uh, process, well, I got the newspaper. It's here. What do you want me to do with it? I, there's nothing to do. So um, it was for this reason uh, he determined that dogs were not able to learn nouns, and which was um, clearly incorrect. His methods were flawed. So in his retirement, he began attending a lot of border collie trials. And he was amazed at how these dogs could elicit commands from the farmer with sheep. Um, uh, just with very subtle sounds and whistles and commands. Um, so he was really perplexed by this. So it, a uh, border collie trial, after one of the trials, they were sitting around a campfire one night and he had the audacity to say to these farmers with their border collie sitting with them, he said, you know, science tells us that your dogs are really smart, but they cannot learn 
the names of objects or the names of people. And so out of reverence to him, they were quiet for a minute, but then one farmer piped up and he said, is, is that what science tells us? Will you tell me why I can call my, my dog Jeb out of three other dogs and ask him to go get Millie and Tilly, two sheep out of a hundred, and he'll do it every time. You tell me what science says about that. And my father was humbled and he realized that there are some simple truths. And if his methods were flawed, he didn't do it the right way. And by talking to people that actually work with these dogs, those set him off in the right direction. So his goal with Chaser, getting her as a border collie puppy, where she was bred to give her eye to the sheep and her ear to the farmer, um, he set out to teach her the names of objects. And that is exactly what he did. That's incredible. That's incredible. And it's amazing, you know, how uh, for a long time we think something is true and then our whole belief system is challenged and it sets us on this completely new path. I mean, that's incredible. So That's um, true. You're absolutely right. And one thing, especially in science, one thing my father said is that we have to believe that the student can, can learn. And if learning doesn't take place, we have to change the methods. So his methods were flawed. And what he discovered with Chaser was that words had to have value. And when words have value, then you're gonna remember them because we witness our dogs learning words every day. In the US, they know the words walk, they know the words vet, you know, they know the words bath, and they either like them or they don't but we didn't have to teach them those words. So, so um, we had to find a motivation to teach Chaser the names of her, of objects. And my dad that did that through play and her, he taught her the name of her toys. Those had value to her. So how do you describe your father's uh, relationship with Chaser? Mm. You know that, that's a really great question because one of the greatest um, uh, things about our relationship with dogs is our unique ability to bond with them. And uh, their um, Border Collie uh, trainer, um, Dave Johnson said, if you give a dog your mind, no, I'm sorry, I'm getting it wrong. If you give a dog your heart, they will give you their mind. So we have this unique uh, interspecies relationship with dogs. And my father wanted to capitalize on that and working one-on-one -on -one with Chaser. And so he viewed her as his co-research partner. They were a team. She was his child and he treated her that way. He treated her with respect and um, found methods to utilize her own unique instincts for her learning. He respected those boundaries too. If she gave to him, he gave back to her. So she was a family member and um, she came first. That's, that's incredible. And I mean, I think that also teaches us it's so important not to put all the all our dogs in the same box and say, oh, they must do this, 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 and respect the individual personalities. And wow. So that, you said, that, mm -hmm. uh, so you said, yeah, he started with toy names because, uh, you know, the toys had value for her. And then she ended up learning over a thousand of those. So, how did it just keep going? And instead of saying, okay, I think she knows a lot, like at 100, I would be like, oh, my dog's a genius. <laughs> so well, how did it just keep going? That, oh gosh, that's, that's a really good question. So what he wanted to discover was the boundaries of her mind, ah. the boundaries. And he set his sight on 100 toys because he figured 
if she could learn the names of a hundred objects, then this was going to give us a pretty good idea about how the, the inner workings of her main brain, her, her, her cognitive functions. So what he discovered was that um, she learned way more than a thousand objects. He just stopped because it was time to do testing and research. But what was valuable um, with Chaser and learning the names of her toys, by the time she was um, five months old, she made that con had that conceptual leap of understanding that objects have names. So that when he held this toy up and he said, Chaser, this is, she had that aha moment that, oh, he says, this is, the name is being paired with the object. So she could learn them on one trial. Now, wow. in order for her to keep them in her long-term memory, she needed rehearsal. And this is the same with humans. So mm -hmm. it's very similar to when you go to a party and you meet somebody and you get their names, you know, and their names go in and out your ear. And then, you know, five minutes later, you're like, uh, what was their name? Um, well, if you, if that was Brad Pitt, you would have remembered his name and you uh -huh. wouldn't have the, again, the memory has to have value. You have to want to remember it. So when we think that dogs can't remember things, we have to look at ourselves as well. Uh -huh. So that in anything in a human life that is of value takes rehearsal. So it's the same with dogs, they're, they don't just know things, you know, yeah. and just because they learn things once doesn't mean that that gets into their long-term memory. It's not rote. So they need rehearsal. So what my dad did was he would play with her um, for a couple of days with each, each uh, toy until mm -hmm. he, he could test her with groups of 20 uh, toys and have her retrieve each one um, without error. And if she made an error, didn't get something right, then he would go back and rehearse that toy. But also he made it really simple for her to, uh, he did not want her to make a mistake because when dogs have mistakes or failures, they feel bad. We all feel bad mm -hmm. about ourselves. And so he created a method of errorless learning so that if he saw that she was going to make an incorrect uh, choice, he called her back. You know, he didn't say no because people overuse the word no. Yeah. You know, it's not a word that the dog likes. It's not something. And, and, and they become anesthetized to it. No, 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 no. You know, it's like yeah. eventually it's not going to bring them happiness. So and I've really segued from what your original question is to uh, no, the word no. It's, it's, it's a good point, you know. Uh, yeah, you so, yeah. and you, you want to have the dog feel good about themselves and give them uh, things that build up yeah. their confidence because if a con dog is confident, they're going to be happy. And uh, a happy dog is a dog that is going to want to learn. So, um, right. so he stopped at a thousand toys. Um, simply because they were taking up too much room in the house. And he started um, utilizing verbs with the, with the objects. So what Chaser learned was that um, words have independent meaning. So she could pair the word take, paw, nose uh, with an object and use them in sentences. She also learned her no all of her toys by individual names, but common nouns. So she, she learned that anything that was round and bouncy is a ball. So she understood qualifying words like bigger ball, smaller ball, get another ball. So because learning builds on learning, he utilized these kind of techniques all throughout the day with her in little short spurts. Learning happens in short spurts where it's fun yeah. and interspersed with play. So um, that she was able to use uh, grammar and simple sentences. And um, 
that's why he stopped finally teaching her the formal names of objects because he was moved on to different learning um, in her uh, uh, teachings. You know, uh, it's so interesting you said that because I've seen this with my dogs, but I never gave it a lot of thought. Because if I say, do you want? And then there's anticipation because they don't know what's coming next. So they know after want comes something like food, walk, or so there you go. So that makes a lot of sense to me now. Um, That's a perfect, that is a perfect analogy of how dogs are all always listening. And some people, yeah. Some researchers are saying, well, why teach dogs words? You know, it's not behaviors. That's not their, really their thing. It's not scent. That's not true. Dogs are listening to us all the time. Yeah. And we discovered one evening sitting around the dinner table um, mm -hmm. that uh, my mother said, I'm not going to take Chaser for a walk this evening because the neighbor has this dog, Casey, that's visiting. And Chaser doesn't really like Casey. And um, um, all of a sudden, Chaser came up and she was like, Rawr. started growling. And I was like, what? And we looked at her and we were like, Chaser, you don't like Casey? Rawr. And she starts barking and Chaser never barks. So then we were like onto something. So we're like, There's, there were five dogs that Chaser used to hang out with. So we asked her, what do you think of Fafner? And she just sat there and she's like wiggling and they were like, what do you think of Dixie? <laughs> you know, and then we would ask her, what do you think of Nora? She likes Nora. And then we, then we'd say, what do you think of Casey? <laughs> so these are the kind of things your dog is understanding that we don't even realize. Yeah. I mean, even just talking to you is, you know, all these light bulbs are going on in my head because, uh, so like your Yasha, I have a dog called Pasha. He's a German Shepherd and he's a smart cookie too. And once we uh, took him on a holiday uh, to the mountains and over there, there was this dog that the, uh, we obviously stayed at a dog friendly place and they had a dog called Kalu, which literally just translates to Blackie in English. And mm -hmm. he did not like Kalu and Kalu didn't like him, but it's been like six months. And if I still say Pasha, Kalu's coming for you. <laughs> 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 see, so see? yeah, yeah. They, I mean, those it's incredible. Those memories have value to him. Yeah. And so, if we can harness um, what is innately interesting to them, uh, we have no ideas what we can be doing in tandem with dogs in the years to come. Because right. um, what my dad was doing at the end of his research was using verbal cues, visual cues in concert with imitation. Mm -hmm. And um, the do as I do, the Claudia Fugazi, brilliant techniques. Um, these three things in combination allowed Chaser to learn uh, new behaviors very rapidly. She could do them on one trial just by um, having her say, do as I do, and then doing something very complex. And if we saw her going in the wrong direction, we we're like, go right, go right. And then she would stay on course. And, um, mm -hmm. and what's so powerful about all of these techniques is my father did the hard lifting. He did the heavy lifting. You don't have to. You just have to reach the point with your dog where they have that understanding that objects have names and they're like, ah, then the floodgates open. Learning becomes yeah. extremely rapid. His belief was that teaching one concept is greater than teaching a hundred behaviors because it gives the dog an opportunity to make their choices and um, use their own mind for learning right i mean it's, it's incredible because you know i think for years and our relationship with dogs is you know fairly old and it's evolving and uh, you know it's uh, i mean it's just we don't even think about them as wild animals anymore they just pets and uh, i'm part of our family which is uh, 
saying something a lot of people you know now i was reading a uh, few weeks earlier that people are choosing to have keep dogs instead of having kids even so they're a replacement and they still uh, make make a family right so you know what is the definition of family and uh, it's it's incredible to see uh, that dogs can go beyond obedience and just saying sit and go there i mean these commands are important to start your communication but i don't think that's the end of your relationship with your dog it's it's amazing uh, the understanding that dogs yes have. you you are so correct with that and especially in equating dogs as family members um mm -hmm. they're you know sometimes people push back and they're like well you don't know what it's like you don't have a child you can't describe them them as, as such but um dogs spirit they're born pure you know they're like children dogs the dog sitting in front of you is uh carries is is a product of human behavior you know right. dogs have this innate desire to please us to bond with us they have this unique capacity to ground us to comfort us to um devote their lives to us so this unique bond this unique interspecies bond with the only animal on the planet that continues to choose us over 40,000 yeah. years and we have to realize it is a choice and what you said earlier was so meaningful like some of the thought processes that we have um are not actually accurate for instance a lot the thought processes is that dogs have evolved with us because of the food chain you know and yeah. they need us for food i believe that's a false paradigm i believe that dogs are incredibly resourceful creatures um and it shows us their close cousins wolves foxes dingoes these animals survive in the wild but when yeah. these animals are domesticated that happens very quickly that they att they attain the attributes of dogs. So what is it about dogs that they choose us? And that brings me back to your analogy of them as family members. They are here for us unconditionally. And if we can tap into their approach more as humans, be more accepting, more devoted, more in the moment, uh and uh more accepting we're going to be better human beings oh for sure uh i think your friend helen is here because she said she misses chaser and now she's saying in some ways dogs are like toddlers they have to learn words and what they mean so that yeah. that that's true they have the same what we discovered with chaser was that she did have sort we, she technically had the vocabulary of a two or a three year old toddler Um, but what's amazing is that dogs also maintain these incredible attribute attributes of scent. Um Chaser, we used scent games to play with her um that were really rewarding and dogs love everything smelly because that's sort of like who's they can tell who's been there, um what's been there, how long it's been there, you know, and um we're harnessing those incredible talents to benefit humanity and and uh and sniffing out bombs and detecting dead bodies under 20 feet of water um they have these innate gifts that are just sort of mind blowing um i forgot what i started talking about it's <laughs> all right i'm just going to read a few comments here from people who are watching jessie's here and uh, she's saying there's a dog still on instagram who was taught to press buttons that say words and she talks to her people really well dogs are so much more smart than we know chaser was just the beginning yes agreed and, absolutely thank you for sharing and, that jessie and jessie is this stella the lad from me if it's not please send, send me her instagram handle because i know all the dogs on instagram and i'm going to follow her if it's not the same dog <laughs> Yes. Mona Lisa is here. Hi, Mona Lisa. She's saying a dog reads your emotions and will comfort and gravitate towards you based on how they read you. They are fabulous for sure. And 
your friend is here, Liz Brooks. Oh. She says we are watching. Yes, yeah, she said, was. Uh, she was a she was one of Chaser's uh, um, uh, good friends. Her daughter Stella was one of Chaser's main playmates. <laughs> she does say we loved her Chaser. Uh, thanks for joining, Liz. It's a great day to remember Chaser. Uh, and then we have Saloni here. Uh, she's saying Chaser was a border collie. They call the smartest breed. Do you think that's the reason John might have picked Chaser? Um. Well, that's that's interesting. So what we uh, we believe all breeds are smart, all dogs are smart and breed gives us sort of an indication of what um, their uh, instincts might be that are inherent. And so uh, border mm -hmm. collies are working dogs and anybody that's had a working dog knows that you need to work them and don't keep them as apartment dogs. So Chaser is a Border Collie, was born in Scotland to give her eye to the sheep and her ear to the farmer. So she and all, most working dogs have an affinity for language. Now, does that mean that she, that Border Collies are smarter than other dogs? No, the, no, that, that we don't adhere to that philosophy. We believe that you have to look at the individual dog within the breeds because each dog is unique and you want to tap in to whatever gives that dog the ability to admit their natural instinct because that gives the dog incredible joy so my father utilized that with chaser she loved to chase things he didn't want her to chase cars he didn't want her to chase critters you know so he directed her chasing to her toys and to balls you know, if she was going after um, a critter or a toy, he kept her on a lunge line. This was the only thing that he really tried to curb um, the direction of that behavior is, and it gave, it gave her a little bit of a tug, you know, because all of her training was positive reinforcement force free. So um, learning what not to chase was valuable in keeping her safe and keeping other people safe. So right. um, yes, can other dogs learn this? We've seen other dogs learn words. You just have to find their motivation. We don't believe that any specific breed is the most intelligent, but as humans, we like to talk about that. Yeah. You know? And Jessie came through. Thanks, Jessie. Uh, she's got her Instagram. It's hunger for words. I'm going to look it up after this uh, session is over. And oh, she's posted a link as well. Thank you. So, Philly, uh, what do you think motivated Chaser more than anything else? It, without a doubt, it was play. Um, Chaser, my dad didn't really use treats with Chaser. He did in the very beginning. So treats are really uh, good motivators for all of us. Um, but <laughs> what he discovered was that she did not satiate on play. So everything that he did with her was, was play oriented. So when he taught her the name of her first object, it was a blue ball and he put it on the floor and he rolled it towards her. And he said, Chaser, this is blue. He rolled it towards her and she would catch it and then he'd throw it, she'd toss it back and then he'd throw it to her. And so this is how he engaged with her um, with all of her language learning. So play was a huge motivator for Chaser. It may not be with your dog, but um, yeah, that was what that was what really set Chaser on fire. That's incredible. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, every dog has their own motivation and, you know, it's important to find that and then use that to uh, work with them. So, what did you teach Chaser? You know, we've been talking about your father uh, working with Chaser. Did you work with her? Oh, gosh. I, I, I worked with her a lot. Um, what did I, I wrote some notes because I'm like, what did I teach <laughs> Chaser? Um, well, I, I chased her. I, I like to teach her sillier things. Um, <laughs> so, and what was so much fun about Chaser is that. Uh, when you were talking to her, she was listening. She knew that you were giving her a message. So one night it was around Christmas. 
um, Eve. And I was sitting on the stairs with Chaser. She liked to hang out with me at night because I stayed up late. And she knew that I would uh, do her bidding. And um, so we were sitting on the stairs and she was being quiet for a minute. And so I leaned over and I was hugging her. And every time I would squeeze her, I'd go, Chaser, hug, hug, Chaser. And so I did this about five or six times. And then that was that. So the next morning I get up and uh, it's Christmas morning. My son is there. He's like nine years old. And um, I see him walk into the room and I'm like, who wants a hug? I'm talking to Aiden and over comes Chaser and she plasters her body next to mine. <laughs> so oh I taught her things like that. I also taught her how to clean up her toys by singing the cleanup song. We have a song called Clean Up, Clean Up, Everybody Clean Up. So I taught her that. Um, I also, one thing I taught her that my dad was not happy with was when she was in New York visiting, you know, we had to put her poo in a bag. So I was thinking, why do I have to carry the bag? Let Chaser carry it. And so I would have her carry her bag. And uh, she was happy because she always had to carry something in her mouth. And when my father saw that, you know, she'd just walk down the street with her bag in her mouth. And my dad was like, oh, honey, don't do that. That's not right. And I said, well, why should I carry her bag? You know, I'm carrying it. Why can't she carry it? And uh, so those were the kind of things I taught Chaser. <laughs> I also taught her hide and seek. Um, which she really loved be between the two of us. So, um, yeah, those are things I taught Chaser. That, that's incredible. That's like uh, what my husband does. I'll teach the serious things and then he'll just go teach Pasha or something so random and feel very smart about it, both of them. <laughs> yes, yes. In Ingrid is here. She's saying, sister watching. Can the teacher keep up with the student? This is a question we should be asking. Oh, well, you know, um, I don't know. That's a very good question. I know that it was hard for us to keep up with Chaser. She was always one step above uh, ahead of us and um, always pushing us um, to work with her more, which was play for her. Um, but the and that's a that's a good thing that Ingrid actually is our new um, director of education for our nonprofit, the Chaser Initiative. And so um, Ingrid Norris is uh, in the trenches in educating children about the import importance of my father's legacy with Chaser and uh, how that applies to their life. Um, wow. So yeah, it's good to hear from her. So what are the Chaser initiatives? What, what does it do? Well, we're brand new. We're just starting it out and it's, a, it's about educating. And um, we're bringing a Chaser into the classroom um, from for uh, kindergarten through uh, 12 years old. And we're showing kids um, okay. what their dogs are capable of. And we're also hoping they're gonna see themselves in, in Chaser and my father's work. Because again, um, learning happens uh, at different rates and with different motivators for humans. So we want children to understand that if learning doesn't take place, it's not their fault. We just haven't found that sweet spot and that motivation for them to learn. So um, we want to understand that all of them are unique as dogs are and that dogs are our direct gateway to nature, you know, the natural world, which we all, we all need to be experiencing together. Dogs connect us directly to a world, an entirely other world than we experience as humans. So we believe that's really critical um, in hitting young minds. Right. I think that's, that's amazing. Uh, I look forward to following uh, the Chaser Initiative online and seeing what all you do. Because, I mean, in 30 minutes, I've learned so much and I've had so many aha moments, so to say, that I'm just connecting, like, oh, my God, my dog knows all these things, right? 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I, I'll follow it for sure. And Kesa has a book that you ghost wrote with your father. Thank you for asking. I always forget. <laughs> oh, look at that picture. I love it. Wait, how can I, there we go. There we yeah. go. Wait, wait, oh. wait how, okay, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Um, perfect. So oh. this book is, it's a, it is a New York Times bestseller. It's mm-hmm. available globally and you can probably find it um, more easily on Amazon, but we released this in 2013 and um, it's about my father's journey with Chaser and the dogs that came before Chaser, the family animals that came before Chaser, but it actually tells the hard science in a really engaging, meaningful way. It also ta- talks about how Chaser, Chaser went globally viral once his research came out. Um, that was a whole nother thing, um, going globally viral, because dad had taken, it took him three years to get his mm-hmm. research published because the findings of what he had with Chaser was so significant that his testing methods had to be super stringent. Um, So when his work with Chaser went globally viral, when it was published in the um, uh, El Sevier Journal of Learning and Motivation or of Behavioral Processes, we didn't even know that it had gone globally viral in 42 hours in 72 languages. We were Googling Chaser and the new scientist had the, the, uh, uh, a, an article that came, popped up that said in the age old war between cats and dogs, dogs mm-hmm. have just struck the killer blow. There's a border collie in South Carolina, Chaser, who has scored a home run. So, this book also gives you, it's sort of, it, there is a tutorial. You get to see exactly how he taught her everything in a really fun and engaging way that you can um, also use with your own dog. And it's got, um, you'll laugh, you'll cry. Um, there are some really touching moments, but you'll also see Chaser as a unique individual. She was a big personality and um, had a lot of charisma. Uh, that kind of, it's, she sparkled on stage. She really loved to um, work and be around people. So the book, yeah, the book is Chaser, Unlocking the Genius of the Dog Who Knows a Thousand Words. And it was a great experience to actually co-write with my dad and um, Hilary Hinsman, who is the brilliant co-author with my father on this. He's, he's an incredible writer. Now I look forward to reading this. Uh, I just found out about uh, found out about the book just now, so I'm going to get it. I'm a big reader and I like to read, so I usually stay away from dog stories because I cry a lot and also dog movies. <laughs> but, but I'm very interested to learn how to, you know, how I can connect with my dogs better and you know help them reach their potential. Before you know, uh, it brings us a lot of joy for sure, but. Uh, Stimulated dog is a happy dog, for sure. You know, uh, and it's 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 not hard to make a dog happy. <laughs> Besides food. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at some of Chaser's pictures now. And uh, if you can tell us a little bit about her, uh, the stories behind each of these pictures. Well, this is a great picture. This is taken by Jane Sobel Klonsky, who has a gorgeous book called Unconditional that features Mm -hmm. senior dogs. And this photo was actually taken on a film shoot um, by Gorman Bouchard, a filmmaker who has did a documentary on Chaser and Dad um, Mm -hmm. in his uh, feel good movie about senior dogs. And it's called Seniors. It's coming out in September, it's a documentary and it will be available online. We'll keep you posted. It's such a feel good movie. So this uh, photograph is Chaser and dad on that shoot and Chaser has a stick in her mouth. She always (laughs) had to have something in her mouth when she went on a walk. Um, So yeah, that's that photograph. That's beautiful. 
Oh, that and the same thing. That's that's uh, the shoot um, mm -hmm. for seniors with Gorman Bichard. Yeah, no, I look forward to the documentary as well. And what's happening here? Okay, well, Chaser, um, we've done a lot of uh, television shoots in New York, and she's been requested mm -hmm. all over the country. So. Um, this was a Delta Airlines checking in. She gets a seat on the airplane because she has celebrity status. Um, so, and there she is on the plane, sitting in her seat. That's and going on every door she fly like this. For sure. Yeah. For sure. I mean, I she was a good go in the hole. We never, never, never put Chaser in the hole. Oh. Um, but. Uh, uh, yes, it was. They, she did really well. She just slept, and uh, um, she loved being around people. She did great. So, did the uh, airline staff always give a lot of treats? Did she get treats while flying? Oh yes, yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they loved her. They loved her. Oh my God! Oh, is this, this her toy stash? Yes, this is her toy stash. That's my father um, on the right, and Alistair Reed. Um, mm -hmm. is his uh, co-researcher with Chaser. Allison is a brilliant mind um, and uh, a psychologist with many distinctions. He was also a former student. Um, so it was really meaningful that um, Dad and, and Allison were able to collaborate on um, this research. But yeah, those are all her toys and she retained them in her memory. Um, you can pick any five toys out of this pile and she would uh she would know which what the names were so did she have a favorite out of all of these no they were all her favorite whichever <laughs> one that you were playing with was her favorite you can see they all look kind of icky and dirty <laughs> and that's because she played with them so much <laughs> that's incredible Wow, every dog's dream toy stash, so what do you say? I agree. Yes. Yes, and this is uh, with Neil deGrasse Tyson, who uh, is a, a, a TV personality and astrophysicist, um, yeah. director of uh, at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, so the Nova Science Now did a special, and I'm going to post that later today because they... Um, posted that when Chaser passed, the sequence that, the segment that Chaser did with Neil deGrasse Tyson. So this is um, Chaser with Diane Sawyer, another American um, uh, famous journalist on World News Tonight. And they had a really lo lovely segment. Yeah, just a bunch of celebrities hanging out, all three of them. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. That is my father and chaser on stage at the Chapman Center in Spartanburg, South Carolina for the book release. Um, they had a sold out audience of 500 and um, I tried so hard to plan out this presentation for them. And as soon as they got on stage, they went off book and they they just charmed, had this audience in the palm of their hand. So. Oh. Yes, and this is this is a photo shoot um, with Brian Hare, who is the author of The Genius of Dogs. Um, he had a, a series of uh, dog shows on Nat Geo Wild, and this one was on uh, Chaser is a is a genius dog. Is your dog a genius? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that was that was wonderful uh, to look at Chaser, you know. And so I wanted to ask you, how was uh, Chaser and John on the filming set? So did they have, uh, did they like the attention? Uh, was it difficult to get her to like in front of the camera? Well, the two of them sparkled in front of the camera. They were both highly charismatic people. And um, mm. my father was a lecturer and uh, uh, he was also an actor in his earlier, uh, in his younger years, like when he was a teenager and a, and a wow. child. So Chaster sort of blossomed in front of people because the more people that were around, um, uh, the more excited she got. 
but she was able to really focus with my dad. But what was challenging was uh, they didn't like to repeat the same thing. So film crews were always saying, okay, that was great, let's do it again. And so yeah. um, I finally got to the point with film crews that I said, you have to have multiple cameras and angles because you've got two shots, two shots to get this right because man nor dog is gonna repeat it. They'll do it, but it's gonna be sloppy and kind of like you do it again, we've already done it. And uh, um, and that was another charming thing. When they did go off book, they were equally as charming. It just wasn't the same thing. Oh, that's incredible. Uh, so Mona Lisa has posted uh, the link to the book Unconditional uh, here on Amazon in India. So guys, if you want to pick up the book, here is the link. It will be in the comment section, even after the live is over. And uh, Saloni is asking, which Instagram account will you post on so we can follow? Um, it's Chaser the BC. I believe, yes, Chaser the BC. Okay, I'm just going to put it up and you let me know if it's correct. I think I got to, I have to look. See, Chaser's memory was better than mine. <laughs> yeah, I should have one. But there's also Chaser has a website, um, uh, uh, chasertheborderkali.com, and um, we're going to keep that. people it's updated. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, Chaser and, the BC. Uh, yeah, that's the Instagram guys. If you want to uh, follow, and also Saloni has posted it on uh, in the comments, and you can. Uh, Go follow it over there as well. And so you're writing a second book. Oh, oh! Thank you for asking. Um, I yeah. I am, and I started this book with my dad. It was the training book that we were uh -huh. working on when he passed. And um, but during the pandemic, it kind of had me get a little more time to reflect and think on this book. Um, so it's essentially. A series and the working title is Unleashed. And it's really the playful edition of everything that you need to know about your dog. Um, and it's heavily illustrated. So it's a little humorous. Um, it's illustrated by Callum Heath, who is a remarkable, creative, edgy illustrator who's done things for the New Yorker, for um, the New York Times, for the Guardian, he's from London. Um, he's he's brilliant. So it's a heavily illustrated book um, with really t um, whittling things down in a meaningful way. So we hope that this will also be uh, for a greater audience. You don't have to own a dog to appreciate yeah. Unleashed. Great, I look forward. I have a lot of things to look forward to. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, that Me too. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm I'm so glad to get to know you and your audience in India. I have so much. We have so much to learn about you guys. And and once this pandemic is over, um, I plan on doing some traveling and would love to meet you all in person. That'd be great. We look forward to having you here. And. Uh, before we wrap up, I have a couple of more questions for you, though. So uh, there's something you said that Chaser was super smart, but not an obedient dog. What do you mean by that? Oh, that's a good question. So um, Chaser knew the obedience commands, but because my dad always uh, gave her choices, uh, she didn't necessarily um, do them. And um, I discovered, we discovered this um, when 60 Minutes came to shoot. And so my dad and Chaser mm -hmm. had been doing a shoot inside for a while. And um, they'd just gone through all the testing, which is tedious for Chaser. So the producer, Denise Seta, Denise Seta, was out on the porch with my sister. And Chaser was out in the yard. And she had her ball in her mouth. And Denise kept calling Chaser to come over to her. And Chaser just stood there with a ball in her mouth and Robin's being quiet right next to her, my sister Robin. 
And she said, why won't Chaser do as I ask? And Robin just said, well, you know, Chaser's not an obedient dog. She understands tit for tat and she's just done something for you. Now she wants you to do something for her. So Denise said, she said, what does she want? And Robin said, she wants you to engage with her. She wants you to go out there and throw the ball, which Denise did. And then after Denise did that, Chaser did whatever she asked. That's incredible. I love that. That's a smart dog right there. So, uh, so Billy, uh, you know, I know your father also passed, and I'm sorry about that. Uh, do you want to tell us about, uh, you know, the last uh, moments with Chaser and your oh. dad, and uh, how Chaser adjusted to life after him? Well, that's that's a good question because you know our dogs bond with us, and we we are exposed to the purest form of love and loss through dogs, mm -hmm. you know, they teach us a lot about that. Um, but most of us, uh, it's the dogs that pass first. So um, when my father got sick, he got sick very quickly with leukemia. And so by the time he was diagnosed to the time he died, it was six weeks. And um, fortunately, Chaser um, is a family dog. So behind the scenes, you know, my mother and Robin, were living with my father and they were, mm -hmm. they were taking care of Chaser and nurturing Chaser um, as I was as well. I was there for the last um, six weeks. So when dad, so Chaser was prepared, you know, mm -hmm. she had a support system. My dad was yeah. in hospice and finally Chaser could go to hospice to, to where he was. Um, and he had a beautiful room that had a terrace that opened on open to a forest and chaser could come and go as she pleased and um it was the last day uh it was the sixth day that he was there and um it was literally hours before he passed and chaser we didn't know this at the time chaser positioned herself right in front of his bed her head was down looking at him with the border collie eye her shoulders were tucked in, her tail was down, and she gave one very sharp bark, looking directly at him. And she doesn't bark. She's not a barking dog. So we, it stunned us into silence, gave us goosebumps that went up our arms and down our neck, and we realized that she was not bidding him to wake up. She was saying farewell. And it was hours later that he passed. So um, Chaser was able, she understood in our minds, she understood what was happening and she made a, a pretty flawless transition into the next phase of her life. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing with us, you know, and uh, it's incredible the sense that these dogs have of things, you know, we, I mean, it's, I mean, it's heartbreaking, but it's beautiful. I mean, really, really, thank you for sharing such a beautiful memory with us. It's those, these are significant. We have to share and we have to be in the moment. We have to appreciate and be grateful. And that's the thing, especially on this day that yeah. Chaser passed. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful for this dog. I'm so grateful for her contribution to science. Um, and uh, I'm grateful for the experience of my dad and um, I'm grateful to be here today. So it's, it's all, these are all silver linings. Yes, no, absolutely. And uh, through Chaser, uh, in just today's talk, I've learned so much about my own dogs and how I will approach uh, working with my dogs in the future as well. And I think, uh, Every dog's life that changes because of Chaser fulfills her purpose even more. It's well incredible. said. Thank you for her story. You know. Well said. Thank you. Thank and, you, Ms. Rao. Uh, really, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining us. It was a pleasure talking to you. It was great uh, listening to uh, your stories about your dad and Chaser. And is there anything else you want to tell our viewers before you leave? Oh, I just want to thank you. And I'm, you know, I'm always happy to talk. 
as you can tell. So um, yeah, I'd love I'd love to see you guys more. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.